purple fingers. Back in the day before, uh, as I say, before the dinosaurs, there was a mimeograph machine. <laughs> it was a marvelous invention, and once you made the stencil, you could run a bunch of copies. Uh, you just needed a steady pace so you wouldn't tear the filament, and you needed a strong arm to crank that lever one after another after another. It was inevitable that the purple dye got on your fingers. You knew you were an office worker in those days because of purple fingers. The church office work went through a revolution with the electronic typewriter. The speed really was just boggling of what happened there with the electronic typewriter versus the manual click, 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 click. The miracle of the Selectric where it had a ball and it zipped around and then had a little button over here where the, you could do the corrections and not have to lay that thing, that white thing in there to do the correction. Amazing advancement in machinery. The copy machine retired the mimeograph machine. No more purple fingers ever again. Well, unless you're voting in Afghanistan or someplace else, they, they still get that, don't they? Computers almost replaced the office secretary, except that we needed their style and creativity on documents we discovered. If you left it to the clergy for publicity, there was no telling what kind of product you would get. We also needed their sensibility and relationship skills for the people that would walk into the office. I was thinking about that as I wrote that, how this week there must have been three or four times when people walked into the office and needed some assistance from the staff that we currently have. This has gone on each week, each year, for 50 years. And our office staff handles these people's needs with skill and with caring. So even with the advancing technology, the getting rid of the purple fingers, the need for support staff remains. Shared burdens lighten loads and oftentimes make for a better outcome. So I thought about today's scripture as a, as a marvelous way of, of touching base through uh, 20 centuries over, to my reading, this very similar concern. We have the early church growing. It's growing in leaps and bounds. People are being impacted by the resurrec resurrection and the, the telling of that resurrection and then the living into that resurrection in their lives through their prayer, through their trust in what they're hearing from the disciples, through the power of the Holy Spirit. The movement is on fire and people are gr growing the church movement for Jesus Christ. A variety of people are joining this movement. They are not all observant Jews. They are people who are coming with different uh, social patterns on how to do things, how to care uh, for people in their midst. So the concern has uh, bubbled to the top that it seems in our early movement we're not caring as well as we should be for the Hellenistic widows. And I'm thinking that's lifted up because perhaps the, the Jewish widows among the Jewish Christian believers are, are falling into the pattern of what we good Jews did with our widows and they were being cared for. But those who, have, who crossed the cultural barrier into the faith, perhaps they didn't have the same kind of patterns of how to care uh, for some of those basic needs of people. Because remember that Jesus' movement was a movement for all people. It wasn't just a, a Jewish revival movement. It spread beyond the circle of Jews into the Greco-Roman world, into the Gentile population. 
And people started to notice that contrary to our affirmation that we were going to be caring for everybody, loving and supporting everybody, it appeared that some people were falling through the cracks. And they happened to be those other folk who had come into our community and needed support. Bless them for noticing that, right? Bless them for paying attention to that. So what to do about that? The disciples are remembered as saying, you know, Rachel, I'm not so sure it's something we should bother ourselves with because if we we're to do that, we'd be neglecting the holy word of God. It is not right that we should neglect the word of God in order to wait on God tables, Scripture says. I haven't spent much time with that passage in the past, but with this Sunday, it struck me as, what? Wait a second. Wait a second. The, the, the 12 guys that we revere the most, they're all saying, you know what? I don't want to be bothered with caring for these other folk. I got more important stuff to do. I'm reading God's Word on a daily basis. I'm teaching you about God's Word. Don't bother me with these details of these minor problems of our group being together. I wonder if perhaps those who heard the disciples say, yeah, I don't want to wait on tables. Somebody else needs to do that. I wonder if they thought, you know, these disciples have their heads in the clouds and have no idea how to manage the day-to-day -day operations of our growing movement, let alone the needs of the widows. We've got to find some folk who know how to organize a group, how to diversify tasks, how to get practical things done. All right, so what do you think? Am I overdoing this? Or do you think that might be what's there? Do you suppose, do you suppose maybe this is what is there? Well, what turns out is that they do identify a number of people who are going to take care of waiting on tables, which might be a euphemism for taking care of all the busy work, the domestic work, the tasks, the basic tasks that are not the preaching and teaching of Scripture. Either way, some people are chosen to do that so the clergy leaders could then think our big thoughts and wear our nice robes. And so it was started. And so it continues to this day. Here we are. Yet the ministry of the local church is really driven by all of you, not by us clergy. People are set aside for pastoral leadership, for priestly functions, like you'll see Rachel consecrating the elements, uh, my preaching. People are set aside for some of these priestly functions, yet all baptized folk are seen as the ministers of the church. And the various functions that are mentioned in Ephesians 4, those spiritual aspects, well, those also are undergirded by a whole array of very practical tasks that help to make these kind of things happen. A movement, a, a congregation, a group, it functions best with diverse support. We need people besides who can consecrate elements, besides who are allowed to preach. We need people who can level doors. Gary Ellis, where are you? We need people who can plumb pipes. We need people who can clean drains. 
We need people who can care for infants and toddlers and teach youngsters and actually stay in a room with a group of youth and talk about an important issue and not panic. <laughs> we need those folk. We need people who can make a joyful noise and make it sound good. We need people who can voice our faith for us, uplift our spirits. Well, we need people who can count to four and then ring a bell. <laughs> count to four again and ring it again. Sometimes count to two and ring it. And again and again. We need people who can set up chairs, take down chairs, set up tables, take down tables. We need people who can run a soundboard, move mics, blend the music, reproduce the video, share our word out into the community. We need people who can sew quilts, make crafts, who can just really brighten our hearts with their smiles. We need people who can hand out bulletins, who can usher people to seats, especially at 9 o'clock. <laughs> you 9 o'clock worshipers, I'm talking to you. We really need you to be ushers and help us with those tasks. We need people who can run errands and deliver meals and hold hands and can hug away loneliness. And we need people who can pray and pray and then be willing to pray some more. An effective congregation of the Spirit of Christ needs people who can do all of these things, as well as all the other things I haven't thought to mention yet, like typing and laying out design and copying and filing, throwing away, data recording, creating financial records, analyzing financial records, analyzing the analysis of financial records, making reports about that analysis and then analyzing those reports. <laughs> Greeting strangers with smiles and genuinely helpful spirits. We need these kind of folks who we honor today. With people doing all the variety of things that need to be done in the complicated organization that a modern congregation really is, we function smoothly and we function effectively for Christ. These practical tasks are no less important to our vital functioning, to the vital functioning of our congregation than the spiritual tasks that we clergy perform. And sometimes those tasks actually speak to the heart as the hand is held, sometimes more powerfully than us because it's peer to peer, layperson to layperson, baptized to baptized. Without all the dear souls doing the practical tasks, the church would, I think, be weakened beyond its good recognition. So today we give thanks to all of these laity who have put their shoulder to the plow and have gotten the job done over all these years and next week we'll thank those that are doing it right now. So bless you and wherever else you have gone, those of you who have served this church in those capacities and for all of you, whether in the office or not, that step forward to meet a challenge that our congregation needs attended to. Bless you all. Amen.